The title of this panel is Big Data Analytics and Continuous Remote Sensing, Revisiting Optimal Control Methodologies, and it will be moderated by Richard Howitt, if I can introduce Richard. Richard Howitt has published widely on agricultural and environmental resource allocation issues with special emphasis on agricultural land use, water markets, and the application of optimization models to resource allocation questions. He is a member of the Watershed Center's Delta Solutions Group and is a co-author of the 2007 Envisioning Futures for the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta. His research interests include building computer models of how land and water are used and their calibration to GIS-based data sets. He is currently engaged in an analysis of land use patterns in the Delta and in an assessment of potential economic outcomes for agriculture and recreation in the Delta's primary zone under different flooding and water quality scenarios. Richard, take it away. Thank, thank you, Randy. Um, We've heard a lot of comments about Gordon's career qualities. I uh, have the privilege of, I think, being his third PhD student uh, after John Freeben and Cleve Willis. And I echo everything that Harry and many other speakers have said. I owe him, of course, my professional and personal start in this business. He has an extraordinary combination of being tough intellectually and physically, too, <laughs> fun and energetic. Being tough and fun is hard, but he can do it. And he's been a real pleasure to know as a friend and a colleague and a mentor over all these years. So having said that, um, I echo everything else that was said about Gordon and what he's achieved. Now, we're going to take a, a break away from broad policy and international concepts to something that's unabashedly methodological. And myself and Gordon and Larry have all worked with optimal control. And instead of telling you what a fantastic success it's all been. I have to almost take a page out of Julian's book and say that the empirical application of optimal control has been very disappointing. It hasn't taken off the way we thought it has. The theoretical basis of resource allocation and agricultural production and enforcement of policies on resource management have all been stymied by the difficulty of measurement and information. And in fact, you just have to think, why is it that optimal control is the basis of all the theory, but very little of the empirics? And the answer is, in, in my view, that the data were available to come up with really well estimated equations of motion just wasn't there. We couldn't get the data fast enough on a time series or detailed enough, disaggregated enough on spatial. Now, so what we're going to talk about here today is this cusp that we're on the, the cusp of going from a data famine to a data flood. Because what is going to be developed and is currently being developed is an incredible ability to measure bio and agricultural output and input at an amazing rate of speed, literally in days or less, I think, Joe will tell you, and also in precision. In addition to that, we, the management of natural resources relies tremendously on being able to detect and enforce externalities, whether it's fishing, whether it's boundary problems, whether it's smuggling, uh, whether it's game poaching in Africa, or whether it's groundwater use in California. All of those things will be, have the potential to be revolutionized 
by the incredible reduction in transaction costs of precise measurement with remote sensing. So um, my personally, I look at this with great excitement because it's finally at the end of my career, um, we're getting the data set to do what I wanted to do the whole time. Um, but somebody else will do it. In the meantime, I would have one cautionary thing that we must be very cognizant of how we turn data into information. And I, uh, I've been looking at a few ways to predict crop patterns and cropping changes in California. And one of the ways that I could talk about in more detail but won't has been borrowed from the geophysics weather models. And I don't know whether you were impressed, you have been impressed by the accuracy with which they can predict hurricane tracks and the noise of the systems coming in and the rapidity where they can say, no, is this going to hit Orlando or not? Um, it's actually driven by one of the machine learning methods, goes back to an old method of Kalman filtering that um, I, I did a long time ago and all three of us have done. But it's done on the basis of handling these, instead of the traditional Kalman covariance balance matrix, if you've got millions of state variables, or at least several hundred thousand, what you have to do is to have to take a, a, a leaf out of the physicist's point of view and take and use ensemble. And so we end up with this concept that the geophysicists have developed for weather forecasting and so on of ensemble Kalman filtering. And if we had time, we can talk about it more recently, more, more detailed. So, but I'm going to stop now and pass you on. And first of all, I want to talk introduce Joe Farnoli, um, who is chief technical CEO of Thea Corporation. Now, Thea Corporation is a corporation which is getting in the emergent stage of an incredibly precise, comprehensive, and promising system of surveying remote sensing. Joe is an engineer, but he tells me he's, he's, he's also um, a serial entrepreneur. And so I think he's happy with this startup phase. And so if we can start with Joe, he'll lay the foundations of this new technology that's coming to the fore. And then we'll move on to Larry and then the man himself, Gordon. Joe, could you, you take it off? Um, we actually have some charts to bring up. Um, but a little bit of background, I am an engineer by training. Um, I took the minimum amount of economics required to get my engineering degree. Um, but um, most of my background has been in defense and intelligence applications of remote sensing and communications. And uh, really it was, um, you know, I have to attribute to Elon Musk, there was a, a resurgence in the, in the belief and the ability of space-based remote sensing uh, data to uh, create an impact in terms of social and economic development, I believe that came about as the price of launch uh, diminished significantly. So we saw a number of folks reaching out and saying, um, you know, things like Landsat are fantastic. Uh, what can we do now to further expand what we can do using space-based remote sensing? Um, another part of my background is I think I'm very passionate about the concept of social and economic development. I focus a lot on the work of the Baha'i international community and trying to look at how we can create a system of global sustainable prosperity. Um, it's my personal belief that um, the world's economic crises are really a matter of a man's inner reality. And um, we believe that um, a vision for creating these data sources that will allow us to visually see the impact we're having on this planet would give us the underlying databases that we need to help us to make better decisions and to reevaluate our relationship with the material world. And that's really a very you know, lofty type aspiration, but um, having seen what we can do from sort of the national infrastructure standpoint, uh, I know the technical capability exists in this country, and it's really a question of will and vision. So about five years ago, um, we said, you know, it's, it's time, the, right, the market conditions are right, cost of launch is down, 
The belief in the ability to do high volume uh, space constellations is up given things like Iridium Next being put successfully in orbit. And the, um, the pressing <laughs> and emerging social and economic development needs are becoming more and more real as a way of trying to, as a, as, an, as, a, as a demand function to create a system to better manage physical resources on Earth. Um, so we stepped back and said, this idea has to come forward. We stood up from nothing, this concept of Thea, uh, Thea Group. And um, very soon, I mean, I titled this, this, this presentation from Entre Entrepreneurial Vision to Economic Viability, thanks to Dr. Gordon Rouser, because I, I'm gonna show you how Gordon is gonna save the world <laughs> through Thea. And I'm very serious. When we get to the end of this, you'll see what his assistance to us has enabled us to do. And I'm very passionate about this because we are, my, my co-founder and I, we're engineers and we're entrepreneurs and we've got a vision for what social and economic development means. However, there's this little in-between point that the, the miracle happens here, which is how do you finance it? This is a $15 billion endeavor. It is extremely aggressive. By many conventional standards, it is insane, okay? but it's a vision that we think is essential to where technology can meet the emerging need. What Dr. Rouser has been able to do in his group with us has been to convert this vision, this aspiration, this technical capability into an economic reality. Because when we come down to having to finance this system, it's a matter of does the economics make sense? Is this big, hairy vision really worth the time and effort that it's gonna improve the general condition of humanity? Our goal, is to create a system of global sustainable prosperity to allow us to change the, the, the reality of how we look at what social and economic development means. And I'm very appreciative of Dr. Rouser's work to help us translate that into numerical um, representation. So a little picture of what we are. We're built, it's really important to kind of understand what we're doing versus what other people are doing, okay? We are what we call a decision grade total capture, remote sensing constellation. Decision grade means data quality, okay? There are great startups in this area, guys like Planet, Capella, uh, Hawkeye 360 coming online that are doing, I'll say, VC grade uh, data development, okay? This is low resolution, low radiometric accuracy, low revisit. It's wonderful for a lean startup methodology model of trying to get into the market, but it's not what we call decision grade. I will be Richard's best friend when this system goes up and we're producing volumes of high quality, high frequency data that can use for these, be used for these models to translate the reality of the physical world into um, developmental issues. So we're also continuously capturing the earth at sub-meter resolution 10 times per second. And you know, when I say these things, I'll show some examples, but these things reverberate long and far into how they change um, the realities in countries. We're also doing hyperspectral collection, where from the visible out to the long wave infrared, we're doing high resolution spectrographic imaging, which creates basically fingerprints of material identification. Um, and the goal of this is to produce enough data, frequently enough, at enough resolution to enable what we call the M3 model. The ability to measure, model, and modify, um, and be able to expand that globally. So we're, we're bridging the, Dr. Rouser has allowed us to bridge the, across the chasm between engineering vision and economic reality. And as we produce the data sources that enable this M3 model, I hope that there's going to be a, a, a new branches of economics that come out of that thanks to his work with us. So we're aimed at directly impacting $65 trillion in global GDP, which is the physical economy of every country on earth that we think will benefit. Uh, you've got to wake up in the morning and have a big audacious vision. This is ours, okay? Um, and again, I'll point out the key to this is how do we finance it? And I'll go into a little more detail of that. So, you know, our goal is nothing less than to secure the borders, like exclusive economic zones, and solve other country scale uh, and nation state security problems. Um, our economic model is not built on VC financing. I'm not running around the valley trying to raise $5 million at a pop, okay? Our model is one where we are building a consortium of what we call master partner program, uh, master partners, sorry, master partner program, where countries will provide, provide up to a two, $2 billion credit facility to us. They get that back on a 9% IRR over time. But the idea is, and I'll show at the end, that we, we can, Dr. Rouser's group has allowed us to quantify the impact on the GDP of that country. 
So that's the key economic equation that sets us apart from what other guys in space are doing and enables us to take this big quantum leap forward in how this remote sensing and communications technology can impact uh, global GDP. Okay, so again, this model of M3, decision-grade analytics, decision-grade means it's phenomenology-based and it's quote-unquote 95% correct. That literally means ground sample distance, it means radiometric accuracy, it means signal-to-noise ratio, it means revisit. Um, we take those vast quantities of, datas, the, of data and we model, we model the situation. The two examples below are agriculture and transportation where we measure crop growth, we model, and then we produce feedback. We actually will change the treatments of the, of the, of the crop or impact the, um, the condition of, of a railway system, for example. And we're targeted on physical industries, right? So we are a physical company. Resource mapping, agriculture, infrastructure, right down the line. Dead capital, creating a registry of properties globally to enable credit and, and insurance to properties. Um, we think this physical model of, of uh, measuring the earth will be very impactful. Technically, what we're doing, we are invisible and infrared imaging, video imaging the entire Earth 10 times per second at a half a meter GST resolution. We, we can show many examples because we've collected this kind of data from aircraft using a surveillance mode of where it can translate, transform the security of cities, of regions, and uh, relative to logistics uh, management and uh, security of a country, this is a very impactful capability. Uh, we're also able to impact uh, in image through all weather with our X-band radar, hyperspectral, as I mentioned. We're doing twice, we're doing the entire land mass of the Earth twice per day. That is much faster than is needed for agriculture. But being that far inside the OODA loop of our customers allows us to create these models that allow us to provide the feedback. We're also doing, any agronomists or uh, agriculture folks here will understand, we're doing L-band and P-band ground penetrating radar for soil moisture measurement and root density measurement. You know, all together, this is a, a set of phenomenon, all of which have been proven individually, none of which have taken the quantum step in a $15 billion giant leap for mankind to move forward in one system, collect, to collect all of this, to process the data, and then through our own FCC approved as of May 9th, KU communication system to directly link to every user on Earth. So collect more, process faster, get it down to the user, within seconds, that's the THEA model. That's where we're producing the system that we're very confident will change the world, and we're translating that into what it means. Just a couple more here. Um, the bottom line of this chart is we, we spend $15 billion, we build this constellation, we enable THEA to perform through the entire measure model and uh, modify loop, and we transform these physical industries. What does that mean? It means we're able to impact the GDP of countries by one and a half to three percent, in some cases up to 12 percent. Um, the ability to correlate a, a two billion dollar investment on behalf of a developing nation to this kind of impact to GDP enables our economic model to work, enables us to produce this system. We have to be economically viable to stand on our own two feet. We're not taking subsidies. We're not taking government money in terms of US subsidies. We want this to be purely commercially viable. What does this do for us? It allows us to go back to our passion, which is to create something called the Thea Foundation, okay? The Thea Foundation will be a nonprofit, which we have set up, which does exist, which will do things to just benefit humanity without looking for a profit motive. Things like providing a first responder network to free, for free to every people in the world. Um, doing wildlife monitoring, helping with uh, archeology, span providing free internet to schools, among others. But the bottom line is, with Gordon's help, we're standing up this system, we are, generate, we are raising these monies. The work is, um, I would say, a very, a very pragmatic applications of economic theory, allowing us to raise these money, uh, the monies, allowing us to stand up Thea Foundation, allowing us to do good for the world. So in conclusion, I wanted to give you a little bit of background of what Thea means. In Greek mythology, it's the daughter of all uh, of heaven and earth and is the, uh, the deity from which all light and insight proceeded. So we are very aggressive with Thea. We've got a very big vision and I really thank Gordon and his group for having the, 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 the willingness to work with these you know, very aggressive uh, entrepreneur engineers and to um, help us to build the language through which we can communicate this value. Because it's one thing to have a vision, it's another thing to have friends who are willing to help you translate that vision into economic reality so we can communicate on a level playing field. 
And my conclusion here is to all my, my friendly academic friends in this group is be like Gordon. You know, love the world, care about the world, and recognize motivated entrepreneurs who really need your help to translate their vision into economic language that will help with financing and producing the means to bring these sorts of things forward. Thank you, Joe, for that modest project. Um, <laughs> and I, you might even stimulate a question or two. Uh, my next pleasure is to introduce Larry Karp. He's a distinguished full professor at the um, Department of Agriculture and Resource Economics, Berkeley. I, I first knew Larry Karp when I was a very junior member of the grad admission committee faculty at Davis. And this one application was a little bit weird because the grades were mm, scruffy. The GREs were off the charts. Current occupation was listed as writing short stories and roofing. He was an interesting guy. So, so he, we, we, we had Larry come on board and he's had a stellar career ever since. I don't know how much roofing he's done, but. Uh. Well, actually, when I, 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 uh, I filled out the form and paid $20 to uh, keep my membership at, in the union intact, but uh, I don't have to pay union dues, and that's been the case for about, I don't know, 40 years now. So you're so still a union I, member. I'm still a member, but good. Uh, in, in good standing. I'm not allowed to work as a roofer, though. Oh. So. oh. Um, okay. I, I think perhaps you, you don't need to anymore. Um, Larry is, is, is the definitive person on optimal control and resources. And of course, he's just, he gave me a, a copy of his recent book, which really has a fascinating title. It says, Natural Resources as Capital. And that, of course, means dynamics. Larry. Uh, well, th thanks very much, Richard. And it's, it's a great pleasure. Uh, to be to be on this panel and, and part of this ceremony that that uh, honors Gordon, I, I realize that I'm not going, going to be able to approach the comedic heights that uh, Julian reached yesterday. But there is uh, one dimension on which I trounce him. Uh, it's not that I have written more unpublishable papers on the topic of, of this panel. It's just that I've written absolutely no, pa no papers on it at all. Uh, and and, and I, I take the fact that uh, I'm on a panel that has the word data in its title uh, to, to be an example of, of Gordon's ability to think outside the box <laughs> and, 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 and to bring together uh, people from different perspectives and, and, and different backgrounds. So we've heard a lot about, uh, about Gordon's contributions to uh, applied game theory and, and uh, to political economy and institutional economics. My intellectual introduction to Gordon long, years before I met him was uh, via optimal control. And I'll say a, a, just a bit about that in a, in a moment. But of course, the, the striking feature about Gordon is not just that he's made these seminal contributions in, in areas that seem so different, but he's, he's done it while having a couple of other careers, it seems. I mean, he's also had a career in, in leadership in the university, uh, and he's been active in, in the private sector. So I conclude from that that uh, uh, Gordon is probably three people. But uh, um, my, my first intellectual encounter with Gordon was through his work on optimal control. And I'll just say a word about that. This, these are a, a, a number of methods that are used to solve decision problems where we have to solve a problem through time and where the decision that we make in one period uh, affects the environment that we inherit in subsequent periods. And in that, in that setting, uh, the way in which we treat information is really crucial to the type of uh, decisions that we make. And there are a number of different ways to think about information. So the, the simplest approach is to uh, pretend as if we're not going to receive any information in the future. So when we do receive information, we act upon it and we change our policies accordingly. But every time we make a policy, uh, we do it with the expectation that we won't receive any information in the future. That's obviously pretty un unsatisfying. 
the alternative is to, uh, to, to solve these uh, optimization problems with the anticipation of future information. And then there are a variety of ways of, of thinking about that. Um, so I, on one end, uh, what it's sometimes called passive uh, but anticipated learning, uh, is that we, we understand that we're going to receive information, but we don't choose our policies in a way to manipulate the arrival of information. And there are many cases where that's exactly the right procedure. Um, for example, if you think about climate policy, it wouldn't be sensible to consider uh, nudging the atmospheric stock of carbon up or down a bit in order to learn more about uh, climate sensitivity or other parameters. But uh, for, some, uh, for, for some situations, it does make sense to employ what are called dual controls uh, th that is controls that that, uh, that not only change the environment and change our payoff in, in a way that we think is uh, desirable, but also uh, change the amount of information that we're going to receive. And Gordon's early work, the, the, as I say, the, the way that I encountered him intellectually uh, was by writing a number of really brilliant papers on, uh, on uh, active or, or dual control methods. And these are extremely elegant and, and pretty difficult projects. Um, but as, as, Ri as Richard suggested a moment ago, the, the empirical uh, benefit of, of, of these, I think, was, was never fully re uh, realized. There were a few applications in agricultural economics, uh, but, but not very many. And, and in fact, the most prominent ap application of these methods that I know of anyhow is an econometrica paper in the 80s uh, that applied them to macro policy. And that's a little bit less implausible than uh, applying these methods to climate policy, but, but still not very plausible, I think. But th the reason these methods, I think, haven't been applied to uh, where, they're, where they're really well suited is because, as Richard said, the, uh, the, the lack of data. I mean, the, the methods are also very difficult. So uh, it's, it's not simply that if we had better data, we could use them. But, uh, but the, the fact of the matter is that we, haven't, that we haven't had better data. And with the advent of, of the sort of technologies that Scott has described, uh, there's, a, there's at least the promise that, uh, or at least the potential that we will have such data. Big data has, is usually, uh, it's, it's, we, we exploit it using supervised machine learning methods. And these are just methods that, uh, that sift through vast quantities of data and try to uh, detect useful correlations that, uh, that, that can be, and, and we then use these, these correlations to make predictions. And those methods have been really successful in a variety of circumstances. But they really, uh, the, the circumstances rely on two types of assumptions. One, one assumption is that the, uh, the environment about which we're trying to learn is, is stable. Uh, and that's important. Uh, it's essentially a matter of out, <coughs> of, out of sample prediction. Uh, and, and the other assumption is that the objects that we're studying don't interfere with each other and that, uh, that our decisions don't interfere with the objects. And that's sort of a, that's kind of a medley of the Sutva uh, assumption and, and, and the Lucas critique. Uh, but so, so those assumptions uh, hold in, in many circumstances of interest, but, uh, but they don't hold in other circumstances. And I think that it's in those other circumstances where the ideas that are promulgated on, in, in the dual control or the active control uh, uh, literature can, can really come into play. And I, I hope that happens. And, and if it happens, then the work that Gordon did back in the 70s will uh, be shown to be well before its time, time and its, its greatest impact will, you know, will, will arrive decades later. Uh, the, 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 the big data that, uh, that, that we use, or the, the big data, are, you know, it arrives from a variety of sources. I think that a, a large amount of the data has arrived uh, through uh, sources such as eBay and Twitter and, and various uh, social programs. And there's been a number of applications, including in our department, uh, that use this data. And that's, that's pretty interesting, but uh, the, the, the kind of uh, 
potentialities that, that Scott has described really open up the field in entirely different ways. And the, 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 the main, um, the, the, you know, the, the, I'm sorry, Joe. I, I, I realized I said that wrong twice. Uh, I, I only met Joe uh, yesterday. Anyhow, uh, but my apologies, Joe. Anyhow, the, uh, the, 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 the great, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the great advance uh, arises through uh, just in, in improvements in reliability and increases in, in uh, the, the temporal and the spatial resolution and most remarkably to me, uh, the improvement in spectral resolution and the technical term for that is magic. Uh, it, it, uh, uh, it, it, it offers a promise of essentially uh, seeing uh, below the surface or at least detecting uh, information below the surface. And the, the, the opportunities that, that that opens up if uh, or if and when realized uh, are, are really, really remarkable. Um, R Richard started out by, or he mentioned that, that one of the real impediments of, uh, of applying optimal control is our, is our inability in the past to have good measures on, on state variables, on stock variables. And I think that uh, uh, fishery economics is, is a good uh, example of that. We have a, really a, a, a beautiful uh, theory of fishery economics that is extremely useful in helping us understand uh, the basic issues, but I think it's been somewhat limited as a, as a management tool. And the reason is because, uh, the main reason is because we haven't been able to, we, we don't have good measures of fish stocks, and without the good measures of fish stocks, uh, we're not able to estimate uh, reliable growth equations, so we have very, you know, very simple uh, sort of off-the-shelf assumptions about growth equations. And uh, we're also not ab able to, uh, to decide how, how our decisions affect uh, e events on the ground. And the, 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 the big data offers the, the possibility of, of improving uh, things on, on that dimension. And another, another point that I think is really fascinating that, uh, that Richard also mentioned uh, concerns monitoring, uh, and, and again, fishing is a, is a good example. We, to some extent, we can, you know, we, what we want to do is control fishing effort uh, to protect common property stocks. We can do that to some extent through the use of transponders, but we do it very imperfectly. And, and in addition, we can't, uh, we, we, we cannot really combine the, the data on the presence of the fishing boats with the presence of the stocks. And, uh, and these, these sorts of, uh, the, the sort of uh, methods that Joe has described, I think, open up lots of possibilities there. So, so I think that there's all kinds of applications to, to resource economics that can be terrifically important. There's another, there's another sort of set of issues that I'm just going to, uh, to touch on. Uh, and that, that can just concerns uh, ways that we, that we can use information to, um, the, the ways in which information might be used to really change policies. So think about the, the role of, uh, of information on the availability of stocks in, uh, in, in decision making regarding uh, the use of fossil fuels and also, and also exploration. Now, in 2005, uh, Royal Dutch Shell, or uh, it was discovered that, that Royal Dutch had overstated its proven reserves by about 20%. And uh, they, th there ensued a mad scramble on their part to increase their, pr uh, their proven reserves, and that resulted in tremendously expensive uh, uh, exploration and development activities in, in the Arctic, uh, which were ultimately unsuccessful and, and abandoned. And uh, had they or had we had better information, that, uh, that sort of activity could have been possibly avoided. There, there, are, other, um, there, there are many other issues that, that, uh, that uh, apply here. I mean, it's, it's hard to talk about resources without also talking about the theory of the second best. And economics is replete with examples 
uh, of the theory of the second best, and in particular examples where better information uh, in the presence of, of market imperfections leads to worse outcomes. And uh, we have, so we've been talking about all the ways in which better information can lead to better outcomes, and I'm pretty optimistic that that, that will happen. But, uh, but we can also imagine how better information could, uh, could set up a scramble for uh, for uh, for uh, exploration and and basically grabbing of resources, uh, and and so the, the along with the better information comes the the need for better institutions. So another area in which Gordon has made contributions. Uh, so with you know with better information, we really need better institutions, and in particular, better global institutions. I think I've probably gone over my time, but I'll just I'll just close with. Uh, with, with, with a comment, concer again, concerning political economy. Uh, the, people are, are really wary of, uh, of uh, increased surveillance. And uh, so, for example, after the Gulf War, there were, uh, there were technologies developed uh, to, to improve public security by means of surveillance. And a number of cities rejected uh, the opportunity to, uh, to, to basically to use this technology for free because, they were the, because the communities were concerned about uh, policing. And when you look at what's happening in China and, and other countries, it's not at all strange that, that people would be concerned about that. And even in, in, the, in the US, I mean, something as seemingly benign as, uh, uh, as, as lights at uh, traffic, st at, uh, uh, or cameras at traffic lights uh, encounter resistance. So there is a, there, there's a, a serious political economy issue that, that's going to arise from all the information that we will likely obtain. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. And now for the man himself who needs no introduction, um, Gordon Rouser. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. And I've got to apologize to Randy. He made me promise that I wouldn't ask any questions during the Q&A after the panel discussions, nor would I serve on any panel. <laughs> But it turns out that one of the key people that was going to be on this panel had a family emergency and he couldn't appear. And we looked around for someone to substitute and it turned out we couldn't find anyone. And that's why I'm here. Um, any event, as you all know, the panels that have been organized go to my research contributions and the other people that I was working with. And as Larry so eloquently pointed out, I did this early work uh, using optimal control, dual control, uh, and let me, let me tell you conceptually what, it, what, what it's all about. Think about a startup company that is developing a new product. They don't know what the demand they're going to face for their product. So now the question is, how do they go about setting their pricing or output strategies without knowing what the demand is for their product? Well, in dual control, and more critically, in an operational sense, M measurement feedback control, what it does is says, OK, it's in your best interest to set your control variables or your actions, your prices or outputs you might set so you can trace out over time what the demand curve is that you face. And once you've got an accurate measurement, not with perfect confidence, but with some confidence interval, now you can make better decisions in the future. That's the fundamental conceptual concept of dual control or M measurement feedback control. I did this work early, um, was very excited about it, published a book, uh, and then the Lucas critique came along. And basically what that critique says is that uh, Optimal control, we have to recognize, was developed by engineering profession, not by economists. But in engineering, the respondents to the actions that you take is passive. What, what Lucas came along, and that helped him win a Nobel Prize, he basically said, wait a minute, economic agents are active. They're going to anticipate your next move, and as a result, 
you're not going to get the outcomes that you expected to get. And he went so far, and he went too far, quite frankly, that any time the Federal Reserve, for example, changes the interest rate policy, the market already knows they're going to change it. So the market's already adjusted before they got there and did it. So his conclusion was policy doesn't matter. Of course, that turns out to be wrong, in large part because markets aren't perfect. Uh, in the FAMA world of rationality, where the markets respond to any information flows immediately, uh, that would be true, but that's not how markets actually operate. So what I was so excited about when I was introduced to Thea, and this is my transition from being an active faculty member to my future <laughs> and the kind of contributions I hope to make in the future, uh, I've agreed to be the chief economist at Thea. Uh, and that's in large part because I see this as an opportunity for applying some fundamental core concepts that can make a real difference in terms of the quality of decision making that takes place. And what I want to do in the brief time that I have available is to focus on the agricultural and food supply chain. And what I've got here in my first chart is a supply chain that appears pictorially in the right part of this graph, and talk about six major areas of innovation that are unfolding and will be totally captured if Thea implements what they've got planned. Uh, the first is precision agriculture, uh, addressing the biophysical and climat climatic conditions at the field or plant level, uh, which is has been up until now in terms of basic information and data is generally unavailable. Secondly, the agricultural biotechnology developments, gene editing, CRISPR, there's huge possible transformations that are gonna take place through this channel. Uh, third, vertical farming, uh, which has begun uh, mostly in a venture context, looking at indoor agriculture, and looking at how to design lights to increase productivity uh, and also be responsive to evidence that's coming back about what real preferences are of the consuming population. The next is alternative animal products. We've all heard about impossible, impossible meats, impossible foods, I think is a more general title that they're using now uh, beyond beyond meat, uh, if you look over the course of the last six months and ask yourself the question, what was the most successful IPO that was launched in 2019? It turns out to be an in innovation that falls into this bucket, namely alternative animal products using land, pardon me, land and plant-based uh, nutrients to develop substitutes for what we have always uh, ended up consuming animal meats. The decision-making tools, uh, both passive uh, GPS technology, uh, alternative variable rate technologies, and then the whole question about su supply chains and where do blockchains, all a bit about certification and origin labeling and the kind of strategic manipulation to avoid those kinds of designations. But here, ask yourself, what's the possible application of supply chains? The next, the next issue is if we're looking at Thea, and by the way, I characterize Thea quite simply, there, there are more than 40 companies out there right now that have, have actually launched um, satellites for monitoring and remote sensing. But there's nothing compared to Thea in terms of total capture. And by total capture, what I mean very simply is if you've got continuous observations that you're generating in a scale dimension of a second or a half a second uh, and a spatial dimension of a half a meter, it's, it's almost unimaginable <laughs> to think about the kind of data that's going to be generated. May I see the next slide? The next slide, what I've done here is look at where the remote sensing and big data analytics will really bite. Uh, if you, you look again at the food and agricultural supply chain, you look at those points where total capture makes a real difference. 
Certainly the inputs that are being utilized, uh, the decision-making tools, it'll make a huge difference in vertical farming. Precision agriculture, which we've had a lot of work on over the last 20 years, and it's never reached its potential in large part because we haven't had the kind of accuracy of the data measurement to, to take advantage of this uh, technology. And that's also true in farm production. And if we stretch all the way through the supply chain and look at, at supply chain management, that too is gonna change dramatically if in fact you have continuous remote sensing and then iterative sampling along the way. Now, one of the major challenges, even though you've got all this data and you provide the data, perhaps even as a public good in some instances, which means that each and every uh, user of the data can take actions, but you can't control their actions. What you're gonna do, coming back to end measurement feedback control, various individual decision makers are gonna take actions based on that data, and now how do you incorporate their actions with regard to the next period's observation of data, which you're continuously monitoring, which is really remarkable, you get the feedback of tracing out what the real causality is. Coming back to my simple example about trying to understand what the demand curve that you face before you can actually make optimal choices, this is an instance where you are, you, in this case, Thea, is making these observations. They're available, they're provided. In some instances, they have it designed as a public good. That is to say, in certain communities, they're provided to less developed countries uh, and to small plot farmers freely. And now the question is, what do they do with that data? They take actions. You now look at the actions and you immediately measure the responses. What happens to plant viability, what happens to moisture content, what happens to nutrient content, did they apply the a right amount of incremental uh, irrigation or rainfall or whatever they can get access to to handle the moisture issue, do they apply fertilizer, do they also observe pests and apply pesticides, then you see what the outcome is. Now the opportunity for measuring in a dual control sense or an end measurement feedback sense, that's what's attracted me to this new area of research, which I wanna spend the time that I have left uh, as an active researcher trying to figure this all out, hoping that all that work that I did long ago uh, that got actually swept under the rug in large part because Economic agents are active, not passive. That's true here as well. But now, if we've got this total capture, we're going to be able to measure it in a way that will inform making much better choices and decisions in the future, which will end up, along with what Joe said, benefiting all of mankind. But at the same time, at the same time, Larry's pointed out issues that are going to arise with total capture. And by the way, they're gonna be the same kind of issues that we see with regard to Facebook and mining data. It's gonna be the same problem because there are gonna be some communities that are gonna look at this and say, I don't wanna know um, everything that various people are doing. Uh, but then if we look at the trade-offs in terms of terrorism and we can observe groups coming together Smugglers, for example, with total capture, you can see elephants being destroyed. You can see tusks being removed. You can follow them all the way through the black market. Do they end up in China? Do they end up with some other part? You can do all of that. Now, a lot of people don't want that kind of transparency, quite obviously. Uh, but what are the trade-offs? The trade-offs here are much, in my mind, much more favorable than the trade-offs are with regard to the great concerns that society has about uh, privacy with regard to uh, Facebook or other uh, institutions that are out there that are revealing uh, what 
we prefer and whether, for example, I, I, I appreciate them knowing what my preferences are because that simplifies my life dramatically because I don't have time to make good choices with regard to various consumption items. But everybody doesn't feel that way. So that's going to be the challenge going forward. And there's been a number recently about continuous remote sensing or remote sensing that's periodic and static. Uh, there's a paper in the New York Times. Uh, you can go back and look, uh, October 17th. Uh, are we ready for satellites that see your every move? Some people aren't. Uh, another is air pollution from every single power plant in the world. Now, those of us who suffer from asthma or whatever, we think this is all wonderful. The power plants, however, don't feel that way. Um, another, another example uh, that appeared in Quartz, uh, as satellite data on polluters improves, Wall Street takes notice. Um, surprise, surprise. So I think we've gotten to a point where we're stuck. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much, Gordon. We've got time. We've got eight minutes for questions. Uh, any questions? Yes. Keith. Given uh, Keith Gillis Berkeley, Gordon, given your background in thinking institutionally, you know, the technology is the simplest part here. Uh, Remote sensing has revolutionized archaeology, but it's also created an opportunity for destruction of our cultural heritage. Um, you could use this kind of technology to monitor carbon stocks and uh, you know, actually track compliance, but it's also revealing information, at least in the forestry sector I work in, that's always been considered proprietary, such that we didn't even reveal uh, what we knew from government collected statistics that could track back to individual ownerships. And so just thinking about this, the technology is going so fast, the institutions are so lagging behind. I mean, it's only 20 years since the military even let us see the unfuzzed up GPS signal, right? So what do you see on the horizon for the evolution of institutions that could actually handle the kind of data? And is it all just in the sense of the transparency will force institutional development? But, but I'd be interested on your thoughts on this. Well, the perspective I can offer is that I'm very deeply engaged with the FCC and with NOAA relative to our government licensing. And, um, uh, the government uh, perspective on these systems hasn't matured very quickly. Now, I'm, I'm a very apolitical person, but I will tell you this is an exceptional administration when it comes to the commer commercialization of space for the purpose of growing the U.S. economy. Secretary Ross has been very openly stating he, he wants to triple the size of the U.S. space economy. And we work with Vice President Pence's office on the relaxation of regulations to allow this kind of a system to go forward. Um, our FCC application involved KU band, KA band, VQ, um, and L band synthetic aperture radar. This should not have been passed, but it was the culture that's been created that Chairman Pai kind of got wind of that allowed our, our license to be granted, and as well as others, we're in the same processing round as SpaceX and OneWeb. Um, so, um, there is a contention right now between the direction the, the, the administration wants to go in allowing for this deregulation in a sense and enabling the commercial space economy. And there is an inertia on the parts of the, most of the existing infrastructure as a, based on fear as to what will happen. You know, the message that we portray is that we believe that um, the, the future of US security lies in the uh, the advancement and the realization of the potential of U.S. industry to take these technologies and use them for good. And we've built safeguards into our system that prevent them being used in a way that negatively impacts national security. But I will say it's a matter of, it's a battle of vision, okay? Do we believe we can bring forward a system to create global sustainable prosperity without negatively impacting national security or individual liberty? Or are we going to sort of go back into our foxhole in fear? 
Okay, and it's a, in a sense, I don't want to sound dramatic, but it's a battle for the soul of this nation. Are we driven by fear or are we driven by the passion of the good that we can do? Thea is driven by the passion of the good that we can do. And we espouse this and we carry it forward and we face the fear. And that's part of what makes our job fun. Gordon, did you have some comments no, on the institutions? No, I think that's a perfect response. I have a somewhat different concern. I think that there are many leaders around the world who are interested in staying in power. If you can observe every citizen's movement every minute of the day, you can observe any formation of opposition or uh, other political parties trying to take actions against the interests of the ruler. I think some countries are closer to that reality now than others. But this kind of technology could make this way more uh, effective. If you can notice people uh, applying for finance in, say, for a political opposition or, or forming groups to meet, to uh, decide on policy or communicating with each other, and you have all of that in real time, it might make dictatorship much more effective and democracy much more difficult. Understood. We believe that light is the best disinfectant. And transparency tends to favor democracy as opposed to dictatorships. We could be proven wrong in certain situations, but that's our macro assumption. In fact, if anything, I, I would expect this kind of transparency to move you away from dictators and nationalism um, in a potential dramatic way if, in fact, the democratic regimes are working effectively. The institutions and the governance structures are working effectively. And you've got this positive synergy that could potentially emerge as a result of having this real capture. I'd like to just make one more comment. My comment, be like Gordon, means be engaged with us in this process. <laughs> through Gordon, we really welcome your, your participation and as we work through these very difficult issues, none of which can be easily explained with a, a simple punchline. One more question. Den Dennis Baldocki, ESPM. Um, we're very interested in remote sensing to kind of upscale uh, land resources, but it is an inferred estimate, and we do a lot of work on ground truthing. And my question, I guess, to us working with economists is when you start monetizing this, these inferred estimates may not be the same value as what's on the ground. And there can be dollar differences, and then there could be lawsuits. And I guess I'm curious how to interact with economists to kind of deal with that, and what type of situations will we face as the estimates have one value, the real value on the ground is something else, and are you um, liable for lawsuits, et cetera? Do, do you want to get that? Any well, go ahead. I, I'll just say that the, it, it seems to me that, that this technology is, is going to me, be able to measure stocks, and of course that's not the same thing as value. I mean, va value depends on the imputed price, and, and uh, the, the better information might make it easier to, to understand the price, and it might make it easier to establish property rights that, that are probably necessary for, uh, for there to be such a price. But, but it seems to me like the technology itself uh, doesn't really address the issue of value. Uh, that, that, I think, is a, a different dimension. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Good.